This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, uh, yeah, so um, it's often been written that the Thosin to Dover line uh, is one of the most expensive um, lines on the uh, UK rail network. Um, and uh, that kind of sits behind the reason why I wanted to, uh, or chose this uh, particular stretch of line um, to present this, uh, this talk. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, uh, mostly the geological and uh, coastal erosion factors uh, where the, the railway runs so close to the coastline through tunnels um, uh, along a very sort of geological active area. So I, I've actually spoken about this uh, the conference back in 1994 when I was BWME at Ashford and looking after this line uh, uh, from a track maintenance perspective. So it, it kind of uh, was a topic that's been a lot, like a long-standing one for me. Um, so just firstly, a little bit about history of, um, uh, of the line. Um, so on 21st of June 1836, the UK Parliament passed a private act incorporating the South Eastern and Dover Railway um, and shortly afterwards, it changed its name to the South Eastern Rail. Uh, the first uh, South Eastern Railway services ran initially to Tunbridge, um, and then Headcorn, and then Ashford in 1842, uh, and then to Folkestone in 1843, and then finally to Dover in 1844. Um, the initial route taken was from London Bridge via Croydon and Red Hill to Tunbridge, uh, sharing with the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway. Um, and that continued from 1844 to 1868, when the new route via Green, Orpington and Seven Oaks was opened. Um, and, and that was really to uh, um, avoid the cost of using the London to Brighton section down to Red Hill, um, and also to compete with um, the London Chatham and Dover Railway, which is in blue, shown on the screen there, um, and the red is the, uh, is the line for, um, through Hither Green Orchard and Seven Oaks. So just a, an overview of the section that I'm covering today. Um, so going from left to right, we've got Folkestone East, um, the Harbour, the Warren, uh, and you can see in blue the, the tunnels, which I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, Sandfire Ho, which is uh, where, roughly above where the channel tunnel goes under the cha channel. Uh, and then right at the Dover end, we've got Shakespeare Beach. So first of all, Folkestone Harbour. Um, so construction of Folkestone Harbour began actually way before the railways were built in, in about 1807. Um, and that was completed in, in 1820. Um, but by 1830, the, the harbour was completely choked up by sand and shingle. Um, and in 1842, the Folkestone Harbour Company went bankrupt. Um, shortly afterwards, seeing a, a future opportunity for an improved London to Paris connection via Boulogne, the harbour was bought by the South Eastern Railway Company who then built the Folkestone Harbour branch, um, connecting it to the main line at Folkestone East, which was at that point under construction. Um, and I'll put a little map there of the, um, the French side, because you can see from there how uh, that these railways were, at the time of, of, of South Eastern Railway buying the harbour, uh, these railways were in the planning stage um, and starting to be built with uh, the French side, the, their own railway revolution, really. But you can see how the uh, the line, how direct from Boulogne it is to Paris compared to, for example, going from Calais to Paris, which had to go via Lille, which is all around the houses. So the South Eastern Railway Company saw an opportunity for Folkestone to Boulogne um, for a, in terms of the journey time, a, a quick journey from London to Paris. Um, so, um, having bought the harbour, they uh, also found the, the problem with um, the, uh, the build-up of shingle um, affecting the, 
the, the boats from the harbour. Um, and they, so therefore there were extensions to the harbour built in 1883 and again in 1905 in order to produce shingle free deep water berths for the ships. Um, there's a reason why I'm telling you all this, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so moving along from Folkestone towards Dover, we've got the Warren, which is uh, which is a very attractive uh, part in which you're, you see uh, you don't have to see railways in this sort of environment. Um, Folkestone Warren is a biological and geological site of special scientific interest, um, and also uh, somewhere that people go and, and spend their holidays uh, at the uh, Switzerland campsite. Um, and there was at one time for for many many years. The station there um, at Warren Hawks, um, where particularly the Victorians used to travel down to from London um, to spend time in, in this area. Um, just just uh, covering the tunnels, um, so going left to right, we've got um, Martello Tunnel, which is on the left there, which um, is the shortest of the three tunnels, but a very wet tunnel, as I remember it. Um, and Abbotscliff Tunnel, which is the longest, is just over a mile um, in the middle there. And then finally, Shakespeare Tunnel, which is, um, is quite distinctive by its uh, Gothic arches, um, twin bore tunnel, very different from the other two. Um, and one of the features of Shakespeare Tunnel was that it was unconventional during construction as the material that was taken out, the chalk uh, was removed through small tunnels, which were um, were made uh, horizontally going out to the cliff face um, and there was actually tramways inside the, of those tunnels taking all of the material as it was excavated out through the tunnel out to the cliff face and then away by boat um, which was pretty unconventional for tunnel construction in Victorian times. Um, moving along further towards Dover uh, we've got Shakespeare Bridge and uh, the black and white photo on the left um, shows you the, the old viaduct. There's a timber viaduct. Um, just about to see the legs of it um, in the photo there. Um, and that was the construction um, of that section of the line right up until about the 1930s when they built a, uh, a reinforced concrete retaining wall. Um, on the coast side of, of the viaduct um, and backfilled the viaduct with with, um, with material. Um, and the reason for that was, was because it was um, at that time the, uh, the viaduct was probably about 90 years old. The sea uh, used to go in between the supports of the viaduct uh, regularly at high tide. Um, and the condition of the support of the timbers was getting to the point where something needed to be done um, and that was the solution at the time to, to build a wall and backfill it um, to support the track. Um, in more recent times uh, that has come to fruition in terms of a wall collapse which I'll talk about later um, and then so now there is a new pile structure uh, which has replaced that, um, which is the photo on the right. Um, going right to the end of the line, um, when the South Eastern Railway was built, it, it of course had a terminal station at the end, and this is uh, an etching of the old Dover Town terminal station. Um, and this etching is, is taken as if you're standing on top of Archcliffe Tunnel, um, which doesn't exist anymore. It's a tunnel that was later removed uh, and turned into a cutting when the, the line was extended round to, to meet the uh, London Chatham and Dover Railway. Um, the position of this station is just very close to the old Dover Town Yard and Archcliff Junction, if you know that area. So uh, this stretch of line then has, has had a long standing history of landslides and shortfalls that the railway has had to deal with. Um, they've occurred regularly since construction of the line um, due to geological, hydrological and coastal erosion factors. Um, below are just, just two examples uh, that were reported in national press. So the left-hand one is, uh, it was in 1877 
when the line was blocked um, due to a great short slip uh, actually in Folsom Warren. And then the one on the right was in more recently in 1966, um, another major uh, um, fall which caused the derailment at the time um, and uh, caused the train to crash into the chalk. Um, and four of the front coaches were actually derailed, but nobody was injured. In terms of managing the chalk falls uh, between the tunnels, um, uh, yeah, Derek Butcher, the, um, the, the, the RAM for Network Rail has, has kindly helped me with some photographs here, uh, which shows the, the long-standing tripwire system, which uh, is there for detecting chalk falls, um, and that's linked to folks in the signal box. And it's one of the first remote condition monitoring systems used for earthworks on network rail infrastructure. Um, and you see a picture there on the right hand side of, of that and how that works, works very effectively. Um, and there are other remote monitoring systems that are also used, uh, uh, including ex extensor meters and shape array accelerometers plus uh, conventional level monitoring, which is carried out every three months and LIDAR monitoring of the at-risk faces, which is carried out every six months. Uh, more recently, in 2014, Network Rail supplemented that between um, uh, Shakespeare Tunnel and Abbotsford Tunnel with a rockfall barrier system. Uh, and this is a Swiss system and the first installation in the UK rail. Um, and it prevents like TV size lumps of chalk from reaching the line, uh, and particularly uh, when uh, there's freezing cold weather where the chalk tends to become dislodged by the frost uh, in periods of cold weather. So a little bit about the, um, the geological characteristics at Folkestone Warren. Um, so in this uh, image here, there's a red dotted line um, on the left, and that shows you where the, the cross section below right um, is taken. And I just want to point out here the gold clay layer, which is shown, which is like a blue turquoise layer. And uh, to, to note that the um, sea level runs kind of at, at the same level as the gold clay uh, alongside the one. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. Another factor uh, is also the longshore drift, um, with which, so if we look at the bottom right hand image, there's a prevailing wind direction that, that rushes through the English Channel. Um, it is kind of like a bottleneck effect, if you like, um, uh, around Dover Calais. And, and when the wind is uh, particularly strong, it's pushing the sea in that direction, which creates the, um, the movement of the waves of a, an oblique angle to the shore. Um, and through gravity, as the, uh, as the sand and pebbles return towards the sea, they, they, they're going kind of um, just slipping down the beach uh, due to gravity. And that whole process kind of um, uh, results in longshore drift and moving the, the shingle in a sort of anti-clockwise direction along the sort of southeast coast of Britain. Um, and some years after the construction of the Folkestone Harbour, hence the discussion earlier about the, uh, the Folkestone Harbour, um, the, the gradual movement of the beach material along the coast due to longshore drift has depleted the beach material on the coastline at Folkestone Warren, uh, causing the gold clay, clay layer to be exposed. So if you can see in the bottom left hand uh, corner of this image, you can see all of the shingle sand uh, beach, uh, the build up against the harbour. Um, and the harbour there has many years prevented the shingle from moving around the coastline. And, um, and over the years, it's kind of continued more in the northerly uh, direction 
um, uh, where the Warren is. And as a result of that, uh, uh, the harbour, um, on, the, on the 19th of December 1915, a major rotation of slip occurred. Um, a paper written by Hutchinson, Broomhead, and the Peeney, published in the Journal of uh, Engineering and Geology in 1980, attributed the cause to the interruption of the longshore drift uh, by the Folkestone Harbour Works, uh, leading to the penetration of the gold clay by the sea. Uh, the gold clay layer became lubricated by the sea and the pressure of the high cliff laying down on the plastic gold clay layer, clay layer caused the high cliff and undercliff carrying the railway to rotate and move out towards the sea. And in the photograph here, um, I've shown you what the original pre-1915 rail alignment in yellow uh, was, and you get an appreciation of how much movement there was uh, back then, um, causing the railway to be pushed out. And of course, the railway was corrected, um, realigned at the time. So what you see in the air is, is, is actually a, quite a modest um, uh, an arrangement compared to what actually happened in 1915. Um, and I've got some white photos of the 1915 slip, um, starting with this one. So these, there's a number of photos here and uh, working our way from Folkestone towards Dover. Um, so first of all, this is the, the train that was, uh, was actually traveling on the track when the slip happened. And rather than the train coming out of the tunnel and into a big, big sort of roller coaster, it, it didn't happen like that. Apparently, it was uh, the train was, was was actually moved with with the whole cliff into this position um, and stopped at the signal here that you can see. Um, this was 1915. It was in the middle of the war. Uh, getting troops down to Dover was an important thing at the time. Uh, as I understand it, the, uh, many of the passengers on this train were actually military people going down to, um, to, to the front, um, crossing the channel, Dover. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the troops apparently got off the train and walked back through the tunnel. Um, and um, yeah, there, there wasn't a lot uh, spoken about this uh, at the time, um, there was a conscious decision made by the railways and the government to, to not report this in the national press um, because of the war effort. And the, the, the point about that was, was that if, they, if, 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 the, if the enemy knew that this was out of action, this, this railway, uh, they would target the other railway um, uh, to cut off Dover. Um, in terms of the railways. And the railways were important in the First World War for moving uh, the, uh, the, the troops around and, and artillery as well. So strategically, it was important to um, to keep it quiet. So I couldn't find many, much in the way of reports in the, from the papers and, and found that as the reason why. So looking back from the tunnel, um, this is the recovery of the train. Um, Quite dramatic. You can see how much it's dropped. Um, yeah. That's, um, next one is this is a bit further along towards Warren. You can see the distance here. There's uh, Warren Halt, which is a station platform I was referring to earlier. Um, and here is Warren Halt. And the photograph on the left gives you an appreciation of how straight and true the alignment was um, before uh, 1915. That was taken about circa 1910, that photo. Um, and on the right, it's probably about three and a half meters from out of line in just a number of hours. Um, must have been an, an amazing thing to witness. Um, and this one gives you an idea of how much the line dropped in, in sort of sheer face of, uh, of the slip in that area. This is about another, well, you can see, uh, you probably can't see actually, but the halt is in the distance in the right hand 
um, right over there. Another quarter of a mile going towards Dover. This one gives you an appreciation just of the amount of material that came down from the uh, from the high cliff. Um, and again, this is another quarter of a mile on towards Abbotsworth Tunnel. Uh, again, uh, an ama amazing amount of material just dumped on top of the railway. Um, so the line had to stay closed. Um, and it didn't open until 1919, four years later. Um, and the reason for that was just simply the, the amount of work, the volume of material that had to be moved and, and the shortage of labor uh, that was the case due to World War I. Um, a lot of people off fighting in the war, uh, not many people around to, to deal with this problem. So it was a long time before it was uh, reinstated. So moving on from the 1915, there were further slips. Another one occurred in 1936 to 37. Seems to be much less documented, that one. Um, and, uh, but I don't think it was as dramatic as this or anything near, but it was in the same area, same slip line, but on a smaller scale. Um, and boreholes taken uh, before and after the war, uh, which showed that the, the area was still moving. So as a result of that, um, after the war, uh, Second World War, that is, uh, in 1948, um, there was definitely a need to do something more as the, as it was still, uh, the whole area was still on the move. So headings were driven into the cliff under the railway uh, at regular intervals um, for drainage and monitoring purposes. And concrete aprons that were placed as tow ratings uh, and seawalls supporting retained material were built along the coastline. Um, British Rail, Rail Track and Network Rail have continued to monitor the movement of the undercliff carrying the railway uh, over the last 70 years. So moving on from the Warren, moving along towards Dover, um, we've got Abbotsford Tunnel. And one of the features that I wanted to mention here was the Lidden Spout. Um, at the back of the chalk cliff face, uh, there was a natural basin uh, where a large catchment of water can build up in the chalk and can feed water under high pressure towards the tunnel and cliff face. And this usually happened in the winter months after a heavy rainfall. Uh, this used to emerge in Abbotsworth Tunnel at the 67 tunnel chain point and shower jets of water from the joints in the brickwork uh, in the tunnel's brick lining. Um, the pressure was so great that the water would touch the opposite side of the tunnel wall. Um, yeah, it, was, um, it was over about a 20 metre length, uh, but, but it, it was, water was coming out of every conceivable gap in the brickwork. Uh, under very high pressure. Um, and for many years, the local railway reaction has been to tell train passengers to keep all the windows tightly shut um, in the days when you could open the windows uh, as they went through the tunnel uh, and a local speed restriction was imposed. Um, a new drainage system is now being installed there. Uh, when the line was shut in 2016, some extensive works were done to um, remove the, line, the brick lining and uh, put in a drainage system to divert the path of the water. So we don't get that problem anymore, thankfully. Moving along the line, um, this is Samphire Ho, which is the site of the Channel Tunnel construction site. Um, and that was the case uh, before, uh, up until the tunnel opened in 1994. Um, and at that time, there was a connection from the southeast main line uh, and sidings that used to bring uh, materials in and out for construction purposes at the time. Um, it isn't there anymore. Um, and in fact, Sanfire Ho is now all been landscaped and uh, is a country park and picnic site. But this area has, has some history um, as well, which um, 
the first serious attempts to build a, a channel, a tunnel, so un, under the English Channel, uh, came with an Act of Parliament in 1875, authorising the Channel Tunnel Company Limited to start preliminary trials. Uh, a shaft was sunk at Abbott's Cliff with a horizontal gallery being driven under the cliff. Uh, this seven foot diameter pilot tunnel was eventually to be enlarged to use to, to standard gauge with a connection to the Southeastern Railway. Um, however, in 1882, the government you know, grew anxious about the military implications of a link to Europe, and this could lead, this led to a high court injunction to stop the works. Um, in 1986, the South Eastern Railway Company made inquiries about the presence of coal uh, below the Channel Tunnel workings, and they persuaded the company to apply for a bill to search for a viable coal seam as an alternative project to the Channel Tunnel. And Shakespeare Colliery, uh, also known as Dover Colliery, became Kent's first coal mine. Um, the colliery was owned by Kent Coalfield Syndicate Limited and was formed in 1896 on the site of the old Channel Tunnel working at Shakespeare Cliff. Uh, but the, the colliery had many problems with the ingress of water from the sea um, and was closed in 1909 and placed into the hands of, of the receiver. Work commenced again in 1910, but it finally closed in 1915 and sold for scrap in 1918. So moving along to uh, Shakespeare Reach, which is just between Dover and Shakespeare Tunnel. Um, and uh, this kind of goes back to the longshore drift problem that I mentioned earlier uh, and its effect on the railway. Um, so some photos taken from the footbridge uh, here, the footbridge you can see in the, the aerial view top left. Um, the left-hand photo was taken in the 80s, and if you notice there, the beach material was very stable. There was a lot of vegetation on the beach at that time. There wasn't the movement of the beach material. Everything was pretty, pretty stable. But when you look at just uh, around 10 to 13 years later, the photograph on the right is when I took back in 93, and you can see the beach is lowered. You can see that like a tide mark on the wall, um, and uh, the beach has moved all up to the um, up to the Dover end uh, due to the longshore drift. Um, and there's probably a number of reasons for why the beach material did move quickly. There could be, uh, it could be associated with the Reclamation site at San Fier Ho, um, the works there. Um, it could also be to do with um, some of the material that needed to be moved from there for the channel tunnel construction works. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, if I'm honest, um, but but nevertheless, when I as local engineer in '93, when I went down there, uh, I could see that the sea was starting to get under the wall um, there, and although that was well known about. Um, the structures examiners at the time uh, were well aware of the problem there and were keeping it under observation and monitoring it. Um, but nevertheless, it, you can see that the foundations of the wall were being undermined. Um, this photograph here, what didn't help was uh, you can see the drainage channel is a like a drain in the left hand photo there. Um, from uh, another photo taken in 93. Uh, you can see where water was draining under the wall and out onto the beach. Uh, well, that's almost the area where the wall finally collapsed um, um, in December 2015 um, on Christmas Eve. And the right hand photo here, uh, if you look at there's some track misalignment due to the collapse of the wall and if you can see the sag in the wall on the left there in the photo, um, that, that kind of just, just gave way and the line had to be shut uh, at the time. So the line was closed um, from, from, say, 
uh, Christmas Eve 2015 right round to 5th of September 2016. Um, but by Boxing Day 2015, uh, in, sorry, Boxing, yeah, Boxing Day 2015, engineers were on site and worked around the clock to get the railway back up and running, uh, completing the repair work in approximately nine months. Uh, a job like this would normally take about two years. Um, and again, you can see the extent of the uh, damage that the sea has caused here, um, and the sag in the wall on the left hand side and the right hand side. Too. So, uh, to, to remedy this, um, a new viaduct was constructed um, measuring 235 metres in length, covering the damaged section of the sea wall, um, supported by more than 130 concrete columns with a cost of 39.8 million. Um, some 130,000 tonnes of rock armour was also used to protect the base of the viaduct from the erosive power of the sea. Um, so, left hand photo shows you uh, during construction with the piling, um, and the right hand uh, photo I took last year, in fact, uh, of the completed works. So that, that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, I'll try and answer them uh, as best as I can. Um, yeah, thanks very much. So what a fantastic uh, presentation and insight into some of our local history. So Phil, thank you for that. Very good. Um, just a couple of, um, well, an observation and then a question. Um, and if anyone else has got any questions, just please put them in the chat. Um, from what you mentioned, um, 1842, the railway come to Ashford. So by my rough calculations, that's 180 years that the railway's been in Ashford. I guess there must be some cause of uh, celebration on that. I think it's November um, is the actual date. So we, we'll have to think about something for that. Um, and then with regard to Shakespeare Tunnel, that, that's got quite an unusual uh, entrance. W why was it twin bore, Phil? Was it because, because it was chalk or it was the technology of the day? Why was it uh, twin, twin bore? Why is it not a single tunnel? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I don't think anybody really knows, or if they do, uh, they've probably found something which is difficult to find to justify it. Um, I suppose that, um, that the, 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 um, the amount of chalk that would needed to be removed there. Um, no, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it, if, if I gave an explanation, I'd start to question myself because it, it, it was a single bore tunnel for Abbotsgriff. Um, mate, I really don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. Uh, but it is very unique, isn't it? And it's sort of um, uh, not only is it twin bore, but it's it's these sort of architectural sort of Gothic arches. Um, yeah, uh, I mean they did things like in the Victorian times they did do things like that. I mean they were really uh, if you if you look around network rail's infrastructure, um, there are other tunnels with their own architectural features. Um, for example, Clayton Tunnel uh, on the Brighton line, um, it's got like a castle turret uh, at, um, at uh, the London end of that tunnel, um, which somebody lives in actually. And, and, I, and I've often wondered there, why, why did they go to all the expense and trouble of, of building that? Uh, it's so different from uh, other tunnel portals, but they, they kind of did those sort of things in Victorian times. They kind of wanted to. Um, have some sort of impressive architectural uh, uh, view. So I can't really answer your question, but um, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And then the other thing I was just thinking with with the with the geology there being chalk, and you know we seem to be getting colder, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers. Uh, looking at some of the old photos you've got there of the the damage that's been created, you know, I'm wondering what we can do 
you know, to, to, to try and prevent uh, these sort of things happening again. But I guess the nature of the chalk material, you know, that makes it a bit of a challenge in itself. Yeah, I think uh, never rail, um, uh, they expect things are going to happen there and they've spent a lot of money over the years in monitoring, um, uh, inspection regimes, surveying, um, you know, the, the headings that go under the warren are checked for alignment of the, uh, and surveyed. Um, the, the chalk fault fencing and the, the rockfall fence, the Swiss system that I showed earlier, is another investment to mitigate any any problems with, with chalk fall. So I think it's it's it kind of still continues to justify its reputation as is probably one of the most expensive sections of line on that rail uh, because of that. Um, so yeah, I think that, that risk is not going to weigh. And I think with climate change, we, we, there's no reason to, to say that there's going to be any less problems in the future with this. Um, you could argue that if, if, the, uh, if, if the temperature rises uh, through climate change, that there will be less frost. And frost is always a problem for chalk uh, in terms of getting into the cracks, expanding and cracking the chalk. Um, so I don't know. Um, it, I, I would imagine that that will still be a problem in the future. Um, but Metal Rail seem to have invested a lot of money uh, in terms of risk mitigation here. So um, um, and, and we're constantly keeping uh, the whole area uh, uh, under review and inspection. So uh, so yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, Peter uh, has, has put in the comments. Uh, uh, brilliant presentation. Thank you, Phil. Interesting to see the really old photos. And I think uh, a few of us on here uh, have really enjoyed some of, uh, seeing some of those old photos. So uh, thank you for that, Phil. Um, yeah, and uh, Chris Preston has asked, uh, really interesting talk, Phil. Do you know if Ab Abbott's Cliff Tunnel is still being monitored? Um, I don't think it is actually in terms of what well, in terms of the track position uh chris yeah it was in in particular i can remember we used to monitor the actual position of the tunnel walls um so we had it was pure purely an offset measurement that was done from a theodolite straight to measure the the walls um and I just wondered if that's still being done or, or now that Lydon Spout is managed properly, perhaps the dangers of associated with movement in the tunnel is, is now gone. But I do remember there being some cliff falls over the tunnel not that long ago where all the material was dumped on the uh, seashore by, by the Abbots Cliff Pond. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that there is still uh, monitoring going on. Uh, certainly, when I spoke to Derek Butcher, uh, he he was uh, he, he said that there was still the, the routine um, uh, uh, monitoring, which included surveying, uh, particularly on the cliff areas. He didn't really talk too much about the tunnel itself, um, but I, I can't imagine that they would have dropped that um, from their monitoring regime. So chances are, uh, can't give you a categorical answer on that, Chris. But yeah, well, it's, it's just it's yeah. a, it's such an interesting place, and as you know, I spent many many hours down there over the years worth of surveying, and uh, yeah, I should, I should probably be taking a look again in the summer because I'm going down down to the campsite for a few days holiday. So okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Phil, uh, it's Jordan. I've got a question. Uh, hi, so, Jordan. hi, hi, Phil. Uh, really good presentation, and uh, you've uh, filled in some gaps uh, of some earlier stuff that I wasn't quite aware of. Uh, obviously, having been uh, on that section as the engineer myself for for a few years, uh, Shakespeare Tunnel, despite being a uh, twin bore, has some sort of platforms in the in the in the middle of the tunnel as well, doesn't it? Um, sort of joining the two bores. Yeah. 
That's right. And I think that when you think about how they would have um, got the material out of the tunnel, particularly using the, the addicts that go out towards the cliff face, they would have needed to have those um, connecting tunnels between the two bores in order to move the material out. Um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, obviously from a safety point of view as well, we've always understood that those um, those little um, manholes and tunnels between the two bores to be somewhere where you could stand inside if a train was coming. But they, they must have been there for construction reasons uh, when the line was built originally. Uh, yeah. Anything on sort of uh, offloading passengers if you did have a problem in the tunnel? Because it's, it's uh, when you approach the tunnel when cab riding, it does feel a, a little bit like that scene from Harry Potter, like the train isn't going to fit, doesn't it, when you're uh, sort of approaching the tunnel? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'd like to think so, but I don't think there would be enough room alongside the train to get passengers to... Uh, I don't know, unless, unless you could evacuate the train exactly at the at the um, cross passage, uh, but that would be unlikely, wouldn't it? So I don't know that it can help with that, but yeah, I mean, you'd have to walk through the train, wouldn't you? Because there's just nowhere to go alongside the train, inside the tunnel bore, until we get to the cross passage. So uh, I don't know how that would work if it was, if they were going to be used for, for evacuation of passengers, but certainly, if you could get to the cross passage, then you could escape via the other board, couldn't you? So there was a train on fire, for instance, something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the Victorians weren't really thinking too much about that when they built it. Yeah, yeah and uh, sorry, the other part of my question, doesn't uh, the Euro Tunnel uh, sort of go directly under Shakespeare Tunnel as yeah. well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think does, you can actually, um, uh, when you're in the tunnel, you can, uh, uh, you can, if it's all quiet, you can, uh, you can hear it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I don't know you can still see my screen. Can, can you see my screen still? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So see this cross section here, the channel tunnel. Um, just about. I know it's a bit small, but you can just about make out Shakespeare Tunnel, where the Channel Tunnel goes underneath. Yeah, so that gives you an idea. It's the same really, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's um, just under the sort of folks named of the tunnel. It goes underneath. Yeah. That would explain the rather spooky noises down there. At uh, when I went down there once, it was quite an eye opener. I thought, what on earth is that? It sounds like a train going over my head. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Very, yeah. very weird. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, there's not shown on here, but there's another smaller tunnel which allows road vehicles to get down into Senfire Ho. And I believe that passes over the top of Shakespeare Tunnel uh, and then comes out on down at a lower level next to Shakespeare Tunnel. Um, I might even be able to show you something about that. I think you can just about see it in one of those photos. Yeah, can you see on the left? So on the left of that left photo there, you can just about make out the portal of Shakespeare Tunnel where the trains is coming out of. And then up at the right is another tunnel. You see that? And that's um that's the road tunnel that leads you down into Sanfire Ho. And it's and it's just in that just uh, several metres towards Dover is where the channel tunnel goes underneath. So um so yeah. So you might have in heard area. only a train, but you might have heard some road traffic as well. Yeah, in that area there's also um a, a um an emergency military uh, access to the tunnel to the channel tunnel um okay where yeah. where the people can okay. get in if they need to <laughs> i don't think yeah. i better say anything about that but i think we can use our no. imagination <laughs> no i won't ask you then <laughs> okay yeah good 
Phil, um, I don't think we've got any more questions. Uh, I just really wanted to say uh, thank you once again on behalf of the section. Absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, obviously, the, the history of the line, obviously being local, uh, resonates well with a lot of people. But I think the more modern stuff, as you say, with the fencing uh, installed, similar to what they have in Switzerland, and that sort of stuff was uh, certainly well received. So thank you for taking the time out to put all that together. And uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. No, you're welcome. Yeah, hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks very much.